The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... I think the Cadets Gallery is an asset to the community for the programming we provide, whether it's our exhibitions or through education. And for me, it's a way that I've gotten through life to make my life and other people's lives richer. I actually started way back in probably 1977 in Appleton with just making some small pieces of stained glass. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. The Cadets um, is an interesting example. It's an example of how we work across the country where communities call us and they say we are trying to create a solution for our artists um, that live here and we are trying to do something perhaps um, that will help encourage downtown or Main Street revitalization. Um, perhaps we have a historic building that needs um, a vision and a use. Um, and where those worlds collide um, is really where art space does its work and in this case um, we were contacted by um, community leaders um, who had led the efforts around a center for the arts, uh, the, the Fergus Theater Redevelopment, and they um, had joined forces with the folks behind Save the Cadets and were very interested in whether art space could create a solution for um, both the space needs of artists but also for this building itself. Um, this building, the Cadets Lofts, provides um, a home for 10 artist families on the second and third floor, um, a home for the Cadets Gallery, I'm here on the main floor. We're focused on area artists, um, so we kind of want to pay attention to what's going on locally, but also looking for artists who are um, kind of connecting to some of these larger themes that you would see in, in um, the arts community. Um, and it's not just I don't think it's just based on uh, skill. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said for um, artists who are like exploring different ideas and different mediums and stuff like that and maybe haven't quite perfected what they're doing. In the current exhibit, we have two artists that we're focused on. Uh, one of them is Laura Youngbird, who's a Native American artist from uh, Wapaton. And she just did a new series that is based on this idea of the dress. She kind of looks at these ideas of appropriation and identity and what our clothes kind of say about us or how we try to create an identity through the way we look. I, I've done a lot of the dress series because of some images I had of my grandmother. I don't remember her, but I, I wanted to know more about her, and I had all these pictures that I was looking at, and she scratched her face out of most of them. So that really made an impression on me, and I um, have done a lot of work related, related to that, you know, lost identity, and, um, you know, 
not being okay with who you are. Uh, and of course, we, we want to be okay with who we are. The Cadets is a wonderful gallery in Fergus Falls, and um, it's just beautiful. I just love the um, the atmosphere, and it's there's a lot of people, especially in the summer. You know, they have a lot more people that have come from the lakes area, so it seems like it's a very artsy kind of town. So I think it's really, I'm glad that it's here. I'm glad that I was asked to do a show. So. One of the things that we've been able to do is provide um, a really well-maintained and professional exhibition space for the artists that, that live and work in the area. The artists that work here are of an incredible caliber, and for them to be able to have a professional space to present their work is um, really important for you know, their developing their career and also connecting with the community. So we're able to kind of give them that that space, but also people are, you know, can come in and inter and learn about the artists. We try to include like bios and, and some text with our exhibits so people can come in and learn a little bit more about the art and who the artist, artist is. So we're always kind of offering that opportunity for people to come in and, and connect on, on a personal level. Artspace is a 501c3 nonprofit real estate developer for the arts. So we um, are an organization with headquarters in the city of Minneapolis, but we're active all around the country. Um, our history began in the late 1970s when the city of Minneapolis established Artspace as an organization to advocate for and assist artists in their search for temporary space in the city. Um, between 79 and the mid 80s, that's what we did. In the, in the mid 80s, Art Space leapt into the world of creating permanent solutions for artists um, and their space needs. And we began creating permanently affordable spaces for individual artists and arts organizations, very much like the Cadets um, Lots, which I'm in right now. It's a nonprofit organization that provides uh, low income housing for artists by taking old buildings like this and refurbishing it into um, lofts for artists. This is the smallest one. I think that they have, um, they have several in St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, throughout the United States actually. And most of them are from older buildings that they've taken and refurbished. Well, they're basically uh, artist lofts that were um, created from an old hotel that uh, was pretty much um, derelict. It was run down. It was uh, about ready to be torn down because uh, because of so much fire damage and um, a lot of the large windows that we have are original windows, and um, which is great for artists to have a lot of light and, and the high ceilings and. Um, you know, all that stuff is uh, is pretty much how it was when it was a hotel. They opened this place up again for artists, um, the artist lofts, in 2004, and um, and that's when I moved in. Just uh, I guess it was June of 2004, um, and I was the second person to move in, I think. and so I'm. Not the oldest person in the building, but I'm the oldest resident in the building, I guess, now, currently. The, the Cadets actually is sort of a spin-off of a Center for the Arts across the street to increase the visual arts component downtown Fergus Falls. This building sat empty for decades. Uh, it was a, a hotel, the Cadets Hotel, which is where the name Cadets comes from. I think it was. I think it was a very grand hotel in its day. It was significantly longer than it is today. It went all the way to the Otter Tail River back in its day. And I think there was a fire that was torn down at some point in time. Um, I think that somebody sent, set the world record for the number of cups of coffee uh, consumed in one sitting um, here in the Cadets Hotel. 
Uh, but it was a grand place. And uh, right now we're looking, at, right now it is a home for um, low to moderate income artists. And so it is really providing an affordable living and working space um, for the low to moderate income artist population here in town. And I think that's terrific. The thing that makes this a special building for artists is that we have this space that is affordable to live in and create our art in it. There are places here in Fergus Falls where we can show our art, but it also makes it possible for us to um, go to other cities, Fargo or the larger cities like Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Cloud, variety of places to go and show our work and try to make a living on whatever our, our art is. Mine just happens to be, I'm a visual artist working in acrylics. We're a welcoming space. Uh, we're not uptight about, you know, we had, this exhibit is different from, the last exhibit we had was kind of a hands-on exhibit and when the kids would come in for programming, they were encouraged, for, for their educational programming for the Summer Arts Academy, they were encouraged to touch things, play with things, um, most art galleries, I think people have the perception that it's hands off, please don't touch. But we try and provide an accessible um, experience for every age group, every level. That's one distinction. I think the Cadets Gallery is an asset to the community for the programming we provide, whether it's our exhibitions or through education. I think one of the things that's interesting to me about the Cadets is that while it is, I think, our smallest project in terms of physical size, I think it's had perhaps the most pronounced impact on community um, of anything we've done. I think that that's reflective of um, the building's position on Lincoln Avenue, uh, which is just right in the heart of downtown, um, the historic nature of the structure itself, and its proximity to a Center for the Arts, which is just a terrific arts partner. Um, so we're very proud of of the Fergus Project and of the Cadets Hotel. When I was a young girl, my family always wanted me to be a musician. So I'm a young girl with my head peeking over the kitchen table and there was an advertisement on the table in the local newspaper that said, you can play the accordion too. <laughs> so my mother decided that I could play the accordion and she was willing to work every Friday for an accordion dealer and clean their house and buy me an accordion. Well, I was, as a child and as an adult, I was a lot more interested in tearing that accordion apart and sort of reconstructing it rather than playing it. So my accordion series is, there's many, many layers. One is to, of course, honor my mother for introducing it to me, but also um, in that art should wash away the dust of everyday life as Picasso has said. And that an artist's vocation is to send light into the human spirit. My accordion series started out with examining and drawing and studying the accordion again as an adult. And then being a fine arts artist, I carried that study into my imagination.
I, I bring back, or I bring forward, I should say, my 40 years plus of painting experience and also my imagination. And that imagination and my knowledge of painting is put into the paintings. And I believe, I, I, artists oftentimes will quit making art because they think, especially in painting, that painting is dead. And I struggled with that in my earlier years. And then I decided that painting has not been done by me. And for me, it's a way that I've gotten through life to make my life and other people's lives richer. So I have a joke almost always, you know, or a, a visual joke, so to speak, in my um, accordion pieces, in that uh, 1950 Ford has an accordion engine, and then it has um, collaged into it also sheets of music. And so it's, it's a rather, it's, it makes me laugh in the studio when I work on those pieces. It's like, where do those ideas come from? You know, not only from my past, but my sense of humor. I like to use bright colors in my paintings because, first off, I'm an acrylic painter. Second off, my experience with art until I went to college was cartoon art. And of course the colors are very flat, they're very bright, and so that was my inclination to have those elements in my work. And as you notice, I work more on a flat surface than an easel. One of the reasons I do that is because I, I like how you, as the viewer, will see it. But also because uh, nails were a lot cheaper as I um, painted than an easel. And, and sometimes you have a choice of, of paint and bread for food or an easel. And I always chose paint and bread. One of the ways that I will create a background that's interesting is to take a large brush, get it a little wet, and take a darker color to go over this to create a shadow. Now you can see how the bed is kind of, my accordion bed, is kind of pushing back there. And if I want it a little darker, then I can come in next to that line again and work with it there. If I get stuck in my painting, I have a few tricks up my sleeve. One is to do contrasting colors, warm and cool. Others, contrast of shapes, contrast of texture. Um, and then my own personal uh, approach is I'll oftentimes throw in stick people of my ancestors dancing. Because as an artist and as an educator, because I, I taught for 25 years at Minnesota West Community and Technical College, people would always approach me and say, well, I can't even draw a stick person. And so then I thought, well, if they can't draw a stick person, I can draw a stick person. And because my family is of musical background, and because my mother has passed away, I, 
will draw her dancing or my ancestors, my grandparents, I don't know. You know, it's just a little ditty I do. It's almost like an EKG line where, or a dance, that if I'm stuck, that will loosen me up so that I'm not so uptight and don't get too putsy with my work. But for me, it's the process of painting and the delight in discovery. And as I work, I want my viewers to also have that process of discovery and delight. Sometimes you have to make stuff you don't like, you know, and I have to look at it and say, you know, I think people would like this, I don't, but people, other people would, and then I make it. I do plates, bowls, um, serveware, totally functional serveware. I do ornaments, I do some wall hangings, I do some window hangings. Um, I do kind of concentrate on serveware mostly. I actually started way back in probably 1977 in Appleton with just making some small pieces of stained glass and really enjoyed working with glass and designing with glass and kept producing stained glass for several years until actually my two sons were old enough to get into it and I had to put everything away because there are glass fragments all over when you're cutting glass. Put it away for a long time and then got it back out when I was commissioned to do some windows for, for a person and uh, kept kind of dabbling in stained glass but always wanted to try glass fusion and discovered a, a coffee shop studio in um, Maple Grove, Minnesota and went down there and started the introduction to fusing and I was hooked immediately and so I would go down there weekly for classes and taking more advanced classes, different techniques, different things to work with when finally they told me buy your own kiln and stay home which I did and so I worked with my first kiln for a couple of years and it just wasn't producing enough for me so I now run two kilns about 24 or 7 most of the warm season of the year. Well, right now I'm going to demonstrate some of how I design a piece and I'm going to take you from the very start to the very end. So what I've done is I've pre-selected some colors of glass and like I said I like to work in the prairie style and I like the more um, subtle tones. So I have um, some cathedral glass here which is translucent and so I'm going to be working in a deep olive green and in a medium amber color and then in a steel blue. I really like the way these colors go together. They, they really fall together nicely and complement each other. So when I'm ready to uh, design my plate, and I mentioned that I really like linear things, so I work with a system called the Flying Beetle System. So when I want to cut straight lines, I just measure out what it is I want to cut, and I use this system, which um, I oil the glass cutter that's inserted here, and I just strip right down that and then I use what's called a running plier to break the glass on the line that I just cut. I like this for always making sure that my dimensions are the same, my lines are nice and clean. It's a very easy way to cut glass. However, not everything is that easy and sometimes I need to hand cut and use my hand cutter and I will just do some swirls in this glass. And I'll look at it and make sure those lines went where I wanted them to go. And again, I'll use my running plier to separate the glass. And when I get everything all cut and ready, that's when I began to design the piece on the glass. And I've got in mind what it is exactly that I want to do with my glass. So once my glass pieces are cut, I'm free to just start with my designs on here. And this one does turn out to be a little bit of a flower design, a prairie flower design, but it's all linear. And like I said, I, I really enjoy working with linear glass. 
So once I have everything in place here, then my next step is to glue. Because I talked about how the air currents or the heat currents can move glass around. We use a special glass glue and we glue every piece in place so that when it goes into the kiln, it's pretty stable. I can touch most of these and they're not going to move. So I know the heat waves in the kiln are not going to move this piece. So I have just a, a flat piece of glass here. It has the texture of the flower design on it. You can feel that. But before I even started with this, I did determine, I did um, pick up a mold so that I would know exactly what shape and what I wanted, how I wanted to bend it. These are just a couple example of molds. And this one is called a dropout mold. So if I were to put this piece on here and put it back in the kiln to bend it, the inside piece would drop down, which would give me my plate look. And so when we look at the finished piece, we have the dimension here of a plate. It's a great serving platter. So that's the, the last stage of production is called the bending or the slumping stage. And I knew that, um, that this particular uh, plate was going to fit this form exactly. So measurements are very careful because if your piece of glass is a little bit big and you put it in to bend it or slump it, you don't want it going over the edges. So you need, you need your math, you need your good measurements here. So this is what it looks like start to finish when I cut and design, when I glue it together, when I put it in and flat fuse it, and finally when I slump it and I end up with my final piece which is a platter. And this is what I call my signature prairie platter. I hope people enjoy watching how we create fused glass. It's a little different technique than stained glass. And so just becoming more aware of the process for people um, they, most people work out of a studio because they don't run kilns in their home, but at least they become aware of the process and how glass is built and designed and then fused and becomes a functional piece of glass. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center, your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota. A relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explorealex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave.